I learned to preach as a child on the front porch. There were no amens. My dog would not say amen. The neighborhood cat would not say amen. So I learned to preach um, to a dead, quiet room. But I have also learned to love preaching with partners who are willing to help me push the wagon up the hill. So I want to know today, is there anybody in the room that's willing to labor with me in the Word for the next couple of hours? <laughs> Boy, I set that up to fail, didn't I? <laughs> No, I'm not going to go a couple of hours. I'm not, I promise. I'm not going to preach that long. But I am am asking you to work with me because I have some things to say in the Spirit today that are uh, from the Lord and some things that the Lord wants to speak in Revelation that are uh, going to break strongholds. And what I'm after today in the Spirit is the expansion of our expectation. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to redefine our expectations to bring us into alignment with the audacious faith of Jesus Christ. You know the Bible says that the faith by which we're saved is the faith we are given, and that faith that we receive, it is the gift of God, Paul said, that faith that we receive is the faith of Jesus embedded and then infused into our faltering faith. He actually, by his word, which is the very seed of God, embeds himself within us so that Christ dwells in me. So that the faith that will not fail, that Jesus prayed that Peter would have, is the actual faith of Jesus living in you and me, taking root, grafted into... With meekness receive the engrafted word of God. And that engrafted word of God in my spirit then begins to release my dead faith. And then I can then begin to believe in cooperation with what Jesus believes. So the question I want to ask today is what does God believe for? What does the faith of the man Jesus believe for? Now, we know Jesus, of course, is God embodied, but that human element of Jesus, that part that we needed, we needed the new humanity, the glorified, resurrected humanity of Jesus. And that's why when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're not just receiving the Spirit of God, you're receiving the Spirit of the man, Christ Jesus. You're receiving a new humanity so that you can believe in ways you've never believed before. So what does Jesus believe for? So in that vein, with that in mind, I want to kick off a series today that I'm going to preach by the grace of God over the next four Sundays called Count the Stars. Count the Stars. And I want to go to Genesis chapter 15. If I I had my way today and I had the time, I would read the entire chapter of Genesis 15. In fact, I would start in Genesis 12 and read all the way through Genesis 16. It would certainly help our Bible reading averages, wouldn't it? But for the sake of time, I'm going to just pull out the first section, the first six verses of Genesis chapter 15, and I want to zero in like a laser beam on the one thing I believe the Lord wants to say first in this series, Count the Stars. So I'm going to preach it in four parts over the next four weeks. But today, the Lord wants to say one thing in particular to set up what we're going to talk about next week. So let's begin with Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. After these things, now stop. Anytime in Scripture you see a phrase like after these things or afterward or even a therefore, Like the old Bible school teachers used to say, if you see a therefore, ask what it's there for. So the question is, what is the backstory leading up to the story being told in this context? Now that's very important because if we don't get the backstory, it's like walking into the middle of a movie, walking into the middle of a play, and it's like, I don't know, what's going on? 
You ever have somebody like that? It's like they come in on the middle and you have to stop the thing and tell them all that's happened. And you're like trying to summarize all that's happened so far and they still don't really get it. The best way is just start over. Well, here we are. After these things. After what things? Well, it goes all the way back to the end of Genesis chapter 11 and the first part of Genesis chapter 12. When the Lord said to Abram, get up and get out. Now, there's a message all by itself. Get up and get out. Whatever dilemma you are wallowing in, get up and get out. You can't get out till you get up. (laughs) Oh, I'm telling the truth. So he said, get up and get out of the land of your kindred. I want you to leave your father's hometown and homeland, and I want you to go to a place that I will show you. Well, that's very interesting because he tells him that he's going somewhere but doesn't tell him where he's going. Later on in chapter 12, when he arrives in Canaan, the Lord says, this is the land that I'm going to give you. And then he says, I'm going to give it to your offspring. Now, that's very significant because he had none. Abram was childless. He had no offspring. He had no seed, no children. But the Lord says, I'm not only going to give you this land, but I'm going to give it to you and to your generations. And then, chapter 13, after the Lord had promised all of that, there's a big division between Abram and Lot. Lot chooses the well-watered plains of Sodom. They agree to separate. We're going to remain friends here by putting up some good boundaries between us. So Lot goes into the well-watered plains of Sodom, and the Lord says, Hey, Abram, come to the top of this mountain. And he brings him to the hills of Judea, and he stands up, and he says, Look around you. Everywhere you can see, to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you, well, here's another message. I'm going to give you whatever you can see. Whatever you have the vision to see, that's what I will give to you. Did you know that your vision determines your provision? The provision is in the vision. Ask Abraham. The provision was in the vision of a ram in the thicket. He had to see what God was doing before he could receive what God was doing. In fact, you spell receive, R-E-S-E-E. V-E. Receive. It's true. It's powerful. You got to get it. It's what your eyes can see. And that, of course, is with sanctified imagination. We have a lot of engineers in the world, but we need more imagineers. God's calling you to become an imagineer, to imagine with him the possibilities that he wants to show you. So he said, look around. All that you see, I'm going to give it to you. But then he says, now you have to put feet to the promise. You actually have to get up and walk. Arise, he said. Arise and walk through the breadth and the length of the land. And wherever you put your foot, I'm going to give you the land. He was actually surveying the boundaries of his promise. And then the most astonishing thing beyond that is Genesis chapter 4 says that Abraham somehow through faith caught sight of of the fact that the land he was surveying was but a prototype, a down payment on the entire world. No, I'm not saying that Paul said that. That's Romans chapter 4. Abraham believed that he would be the heir of the cosmos, of the world. He actually believed that by doing his part to mark off a limited piece of land would make him an heir to an unlimited planet. Somebody needs to get up and walk. I don't mean right now while I'm preaching. You can stay seated. But somebody needs to get up and walk. You need to start walking out your promise. It's, It's one thing to see it. It's another thing to say it. But I want to know, can you walk it? Can you walk your talk? Can you actually begin to put action, obedience? Can you take the risk? Can you navigate the edge of the cliff? 
Can you walk the tightrope that it feels like you're on when in reality that's just an illusion? But you feel like you're walking a tightrope. You feel like you're on the edge and about to fall. But God says, I need you to get up and put some action to your faith. For faith without works is dead being alone. God wants you to get up and walk it out. So after these things, the word of the Lord comes and says to Abram, after what things? After God had said, I'm taking you to a land that you don't know yet. I'm going to give you this land, the land of Canaan, and it's going to be to your generations. And I'm going to give you the land, whatever you can see and whatever you can walk off. And then in chapter 14, after Abram had settled by the oaks of Mamre, after he had settled, uh huh, there was war in the land. Because sometimes when you start getting settled on a promise, after you've walked it off and after you've gotten hold of what God has said, then there's a battle that begins to fight you for your promise. And Abraham arises with 318 servants born and trained in his own house. And he amasses and marshals his army and he chases down the kings of Elam who had captured his nephew Lot and all of his family and possessions and all the belongings and the spoils of Sodom and the cities of the plain. He chased them down and caught them on the other side of of the city of Dan. And then when he caught them, he smote them in the middle of the night. He split his group up into separate groups and they came on them while they were sleeping, scared them half to death, scattered them seven different directions directions and chased them all the way to the north of Damascus. Now, there was no Amtrak back then. There was no American Airlines back then. There was no, you know, mechanized, motorized military divisions back then. These people were running on horseback, chasing down the enemy. What an epic victory. And the Bible says he not only chased them down, but he recovered everything that they had lost. And it's right after this After these things, he met Melchizedek, received the bread and the wine, gave the tenth to Melchizedek. After all of this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, do not be afraid. Now, my question is, why was Abram afraid? What was he afraid of? Put that away for later. We'll talk about it. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your protection. And your reward, your provision, shall be very great. The Lord said, I am your protection and I am your provision. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? I like that phrase. I continue. I go on being without a child. It keeps on happening. I have been living in this reality for a long time, God. I Want to know, you told me that the promise would be to me and to my children and that through my children, the nations of the earth would be blessed and I don't have any children. It's hard to believe it's going to come to pass when I have no children. The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you've given me no offspring. I love the fact that he repeated himself. Does anybody know why Abraham repeated himself? Because God didn't answer. There was a long pause between the two questions. There was a long time of God saying nothing. Appeared to him in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. I'm your protection. I'm your provision. And then goes silent. Well, what are you going to do? You've given me no child. No answer. No answer. No answer. No answer. Some of you are living in the delay. Some of you are living in the in-between. Some of you are living in between the repeated questions. Some of you have been continuing childless. I don't mean natural children necessarily, but I mean the promise, the answer, the prayers you've been groaning and crying for. It seems like you're living in the delay. Oh, somebody help me preach. Anybody in the room right now been living in the delay? You've been living in the delay. Then I'm telling you what Jesus said do in Luke chapter 18 is come back for round two. Come back and pray it again. Come back before the Lord. Don't lose heart, Jesus said. Keep on coming and praying like the widow with the unjust judge. Keep knocking on that door. Don't stop knocking on the door. It's going to open up for sure. That was another song I heard in my childhood. Don't stop knocking on that door. It's going to open up for sure. In the name of Jesus, keep praying, keep asking, keep believing. The Lord will answer you. You've given me no offspring. A slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord, here it came. This man shall not be your heir, no one, but your very own issue shall be your heir. Look at verse 5. 
God brought him outside. God brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars. I love the way one version puts it, if you think you can. Count the stars if you think you can. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now what the Holy Spirit is focusing on today is Abram's tent. Abram had a structure that limited his vision. How can you count the stars lying in a tent with a roof over your head? How can you count the stars when you're doing life settled by the oaks of memory? Oh, the settled just got unsettled because a war broke out. And he had to chase the enemy all the way past Damascus and then come back home. The settled became unsettled because now, this is where some of you are. Some of you have been the settled that have suddenly become unsettled because your nice, predictable routines have been disrupted. I'm preaching to some people in the room that your five-year plan just went all to hell. Pardon me if you think I'm cussing, but it's the reality you're living in right now. When I say hell, I mean quite literally. (laughs) Your five-year plan suddenly became up. I don't have a clue what I'm going to do for the next five years. Because everything, I want to know who in the room, when you were 18, 19, 20, had your whole future mapped out. I had mine mapped out by about 12. Oh, yeah, I I knew what I was going to do. I had it all mapped. I, I mapped it out again at 14, 15, I mapped it out again when I was 20. I mapped it out again when I got married at 22. I, I've mapped it out about a thousand times since then. <laughs> and the problem is, is every time I keep mapping it out, I'm using the wrong maps. <laughs> Apparently, I'm on Google Maps and he's on Apple or something. I don't know. I mean, that's apostolic, you understand. <laughs> I want to know who in the room has felt like you're settled has become unsettled. That your predictable routine, all the things you believed God was going to do. You know, it's hard to, to have faith when everything you have believed for seems so, so neat and tidy, so, so nice and pretty, so predictable. And all of a sudden, God just has a way. It's like he has a ministry of unpredictability. <laughs> Anybody ever been caught in the gears of God's process? And it's like he's chewing you up and spitting you out. And everything you thought was going to happen, everything you imagined and dreamed with God just begins to come apart and the wheels start coming off your chariot. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody today. You see, the first thing God does before he can get you outside of the tent that you have constructed, before he can get you outside the box of your limited expectations, before he can get you outside of the systems that you have lived in for so long, so predictably, so comfortable, the only way he can get you to be willing to come out, get out of your easy chair, climb out of your lazy boy, set down your glass of iced tea, And come outside with me. The only way God can get you to come outside of the predictable and the routine. The only way he can shake you up enough to get you out of your limited expectations is he's got to let a little war break out. Yeah. And when the war breaks out, you find yourself in an unsettled place. And suddenly Abram is afraid. And here you are living now with fear that you never had before, dealing with uncertainties. There are some of you, when God began to love on you and draw you to him, you thought it was going to be easy. You thought it was going to be precious. You thought it was just going to be kumbaya, you and Jesus just having a loving experience together, only to find out that he absolutely roared through your world like a hurricane. 
There are some of you that you've decided, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to sign up for that inner healing stuff. Because the Lord knows I need a little cherry on top. You know, everything's pretty good for me right now. But, you know, if I was to go after a little healing, you never know. I might just be a little more better, you know. I'm already real composed, and I kind of know what I want in life, and I don't, I don't need too much of that therapy stuff. Don't get me on the couch. I'm fine over here. I'm doing pretty good, but I'll tell you what. I'll go do a little bit of that inner healing stuff just to see if maybe the Lord might, you know, have a little tweak here and there. You know, put a little cherry on top, just kind of, you know, a little fresh coat of paint's really all I need. Mm-hmm. And you walked in, (laughs) and brother, the hurricane Jesus came roaring through your world. And I know it happened to me, and God began to turn me upside down. And the stuff I thought, you know, the suggestions I had offered that I felt like he could work on in me. You know, the stuff he could slightly improve because I was already doing so well. It's It's like he ignored my suggestions altogether. I have found out heaven does not have a suggestion box. That is not what prayer is, by the way. It's not the Lord's suggestion box. No, no, no. All of a sudden, I found myself in the middle of a storm, and he began to unsettle me, and he began to rock my world, and he began to break down things in me I didn't know needed breaking, and he began to tear things apart in me that I thought I had fixed just like I liked it. Don't mess with my little world. I got my tent put up just like I like it. I put my wall right 10 feet that direction and right over here. I mean, I I stepped it off and everything. I put my other little wall right over here. That's just how I like it. I hung my little pictures on the wall. I got my ceiling at the 10 foot height. I like it like that because I'm so tall, you know, and I have this tent just all around me. I got my dirt floor all nice and polished and I poured water on it to harden that dirt down. And I, you know, they could do that. Those dirt floors, they could make it hard as a wood floor. And I've got my floor all clean and swept. I got my pictures hung over here got my favorite little recliner over in the corner i got my coffee pot that goes off at six o'clock in the morning i got everything just like i like it and all of a sudden god says come outside that sounds like a threat (laughs) come outside i want to talk to you it's like whoa you don't want to get in a boxing match with god You're not winning that one. Your arms are too short. (laughs) I mean, that's scripture. His arm is not short. Isn't that what it says? See, y'all think I'm making stuff up when I'm really just preaching the word. God says, come outside. I need four guys to help me. Nicholas, Christopher, Jeremy, and Jeremy. Come up here and join me. These men are all, they're all built like a wall. So I, I want y'all to come up here. Let, let us see. Christopher, you go right back here. Nicholas, you stand right up here. Go on that corner. Jeremy, you come up here. And, and Father Jeremy, you come up here. And I want y'all to get in a good line. Now, I want my house squared up. I want it squared up really good. So y'all line up real good. There we go. All right, all right, all right, all right. Hey, come on. Let's see if these guys ever made a bed before. I got my four walls here all built. Hang on, I'll leave that ceiling in a minute. Don't put it up yet. Your arms will wear out if you do. I got my four walls in place. Just drop it down for now because I'm going to back up and I'll fall all over it if I... Yeah, yeah, just pull it back over there, guys. Just pull it back out of the way. So I got my four walls up. And this is my house just the way I like it. I've got it designed the way I want it. And I want you to think about what is it in your life that has become a structure or an expectation that you have constructed. Expectations concerning your children. I want to know if anybody besides me have kids that did not learn the script. And what what bothers me is I had it all worked out. It's like I, I, I knew exactly what you're supposed to do. But for whatever reason... Gina and I have commented upon this as parents of six children. We have commented upon this. They have, for some odd reason, a mind of their own. (laughs) This we have discovered on many occasions looking for the off button. If we just shut them off for a minute. And then as they grow up, it doesn't change. They just get these ideas. They, They seem to think they are their own person. They have their own life. 
So who has, who's had expectations for your children? That the Lord said, I need you to come outside. We got to talk about this. <laughs> what, what about your finances? And anybody, you're going to be a billionaire by now, right? I mean, come on. Bill Gates was going to be coming to you for a loan. And, and yet, here you are. <laughs> I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but here you are. Now, if you are the one that Bill Gates is coming for, to for a loan, come and talk to me after church. <laughs> I want some advice. So I got my four walls all in place. Everything's positioned like I like it. And God says, I want you to come outside. Why? And next week we're going to talk about this. Because you cannot count the stars until you come out of the box of your limited expectation. You have been praying prayers that are so far beneath what God has been dreaming for you. You've been asking God for stuff that is so different than the way he wants it to go because he designed you before time began. He handcrafted you and you proceeded and came forth from him as a piece of code, if you want to think about computers. You came forth as a line of code that emanated from God himself and was embedded within the womb of your mother so that you might live out in the world a particular destiny that reveals God in a way that only you can reveal him. Do you see that? You are special. The old preacher used to say special. You are special in the name of Jesus. You have been chosen. You have been called. You have been hand selected. The problem is your definition of special and God's definition of special are not the same. And so when you start defining favor, you answer in the phone, blessed and highly favored. But when you start defining favor, your definition of favor doesn't always match God's. I wish somebody would help me preach right now. Check your neighbor and make sure their amen is not broke. You set up the boundaries of your expectation. You define what you... And the whole point of prayer is not to get God somehow through some sort of holy extortion to give you what you want. But prayer is about coming out of the box of your expectations and standing under the tent that God pitched. The Bible calls the heavens the tabernacle which God has pitched and not man. God has dreams for you you haven't even dreamed of yet. Now, can, will you take that message home and preach the rest of that to yourself? Do you have enough right there to preach the rest of that to yourself? Because the Holy Spirit wants to say something about the church. Because here's the problem. The church of Jesus Christ is also, like us as individuals, crafted by human expectations we have turned the church into an institution designed for human satisfaction yeah we have so we've put up the wall over here of limited ecclesia or limited church and what that means is is that we have reduced church down to largely religious theater where spectators come in to observe paid professionals do church for them while they applaud politely when it's well done. We bring our kids to the kids' department to teach our kids about Jesus. We pay the preacher to teach us powerfully and dynamically three easy steps to tie your shoes in Jesus' name. Talk to me now. I know, I know I'm being just a little bit snarky there, but I want to know, am I telling the truth? How much have we seen churches become just that? To where the ecclesia has been reduced down to religious theater. And the reason for that is because we have reduced church down to the means by which I get saved and go to heaven when I die. That's what church has become. Church has lost its kingdom dimension. But what Jesus said he would build in Matthew chapter 16 is ecclesia. And ecclesia is, yes, it is a religious gathering, by the way, but it is a religious governmental gathering. It is gathering for worship, gathering for priestly ministry. It is gathering for all of that. Yes, it is. But it's not only priestly, it's prophetic. And it's not only prophetic, it is kingly. 
priest, prophet, and king. That's what an ecclesia is meant to do when it gathers. When we come together, we are meant to minister. So today, in the name of Jesus, when I step outside the box of institutional church, let me tell you what I see. I see that wall of limited ecclesia being transformed into the unlimited ecclesia. I see the ecclesia of King Jesus rediscovering its purpose on the planet. I see the ecclesia of King Jesus being infused with a brand new revelation of what we're put on the planet to do. I see the ecclesia of King Jesus coming into its authority. I see the ecclesia of King Jesus being centered around intercession that transforms the world. I see the ecclesia of King Jesus seeing a restoration of fivefold ministry where the apostles prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers equip the saints so that when you leave the ecclesia, you have keys in your hand. Keys that open the gates of hell within your metron. Keys that give you authority within your world so that you go out into your field. And when you go into your field, field you carry keys that apostles prophets evangelists shepherds and teachers that the body of christ has released to you so that when you go out into the world you have keys to take dominion and authority where the ingress and egress of demonic powers and the power of death and sin and death is limited by the authority that you carry let i preach I, i i preached a message a few months ago you need to go back and listen to it where did i leave my keys Where did I leave my keys? Because the problem is too many believers think that the keys belong on a key ring held by the clergy. They think that the keys of the kingdom are only entrusted to the professionals, the preachers, the pastors. And they think that they have no keys. In fact, if they face a gate of hell, they call the preacher. one 900 dial a preacher I need you, pastor, to give me a key to, to defeat this evil spirit in my life. No, you have a key. The key is already yours. And so I see... Let me tell you what I see when I step outside the tent, Abram's tent. When I step outside the tent of institutional church, I'll tell you what I see. I see unlimited ecclesia. Ah, but over here, this wall is limited kingdom. Now, you see, the problem with the idea of limited kingdom is is everybody believes in the kingdom of God that follows Jesus. Of course, we believe in the kingdom of God. It's just that most people believe the kingdom of God is literally only what happens in my heart until Jesus comes again. Then when Jesus comes again, the kingdom of God will then be manifest on the earth. And so they believe there's going to be this thousand-year reign called the millennium, and that's when Jesus is going to rule on the earth. There's a real problem with that. The New Testament teaches clearly that Jesus is reigning already. That he is reigning at the right hand of the Father. In fact, the New Testament teaches that the reign of Christ at the right hand of the Father is absolutely essential to Christ's victory over his enemies in the earth. The Bible teaches very clearly that Christ, who is the head of the church, is winning the victory as God puts the enemies of Christ under the feet of Jesus. So if we are his, his body, then who are his feet? We are, which means that the victory of Christ is happening now. So when I step out of the box of limited kingdom, of limited ecclesia, let me tell you what I see. I see the gospel of the kingdom breaking like a tsunami upon the nations. I see the church of Jesus Christ coming awake to the task and the commission and the mission and the agenda that we have been given in the present. I see the church of Jesus Christ coming alive to the fact that we're not waiting for Jesus to come back and do our homework for us, but that Jesus is doing the work through us right here and right now, and that the principalities and powers that were defeated by Christ at the cross are being subdued by the church right here right now let me tell you that the Bible Jesus said you cannot spoil a strong man's house until you first bind the strong man the only way we can spoil the house of the strong man in Mansfield Texas is there's got to be an ecclesia that believes the gospel of the kingdom enough to Bind the strong man through the preaching of the gospel, through the power of prayer and praise and worship. I'm not talking about going downtown and cussing the devil. 
No, I'm talking about going downtown and worshiping God. But if you'll worship God, devils fall. Jesus said, while you were preaching the gospel, I was watching Satan fall like lightning from heaven. If you want the devil to come down, start preaching the gospel. Start praising God. Start giving God the glory. Check your neighbor. Make sure they're helping me right now. I got to preach to somebody in the spirit and tell you that I see an unlimited ecclesia. I see unlimited kingdom. Oh, but I got another wall. Got another wall, and this one's limited grace. Because most Christians believe we get just enough grace to get us saved. But then after that, we got to keep ourselves saved. And we don't believe in that full grace of God. So you know what I see? When I step out of the box, I see a revelation of the grace of God along with the gospel of the kingdom because I'm telling you grace is the fuel of generational momentum you cannot see the kingdom come in the world through the efforts of flesh it has to be through the collaborative cooperative work of the grace of God where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you and me and we stand together with Christ and he does his work in and through us it is Christ in you the hope of glory oh but I got another wall and this one is Limited purpose. I could have probably chosen a, another set of four walls, but these are the ones I felt like talking about. Limited ecclesia, limited kingdom, limited grace, and limited purpose. Because most Christians believe their purpose in the world is to get saved and go to heaven when they die. And the Lord wants you to understand that you were handcrafted for the task of dominion. And there is a work of dominion. He made you a little lower than the angels. He crowned you with glory and honor. And he has set you over the works of his hands. And that's not postponed until Jesus comes again. That's happening right now. You have been handcrafted. There is a task in the creation of God that only you can perform. And so your purpose is much more. Than just hoping I go to heaven when I die. You have a purpose in the earth right now. Oh, but, all, but a four-walled tent needs a ceiling. And this is where you guys are going to make the bid. I'm almost done. For those of you that are, have never heard me preach before, you're probably wondering, does this thing end? And the good news is, yes, but not yet. But Almost. Okay, now, guys, I need this high enough that I can live in it. Uh, whoa, now. Gonna mess my hair up. Now, there's a ceiling on this tent. And since I have limited ecclesia and limited kingdom and limited grace and limited purpose, guess what else I got? Limited eschatology. Oh, that's a big word. It just means the way I think about the end time. I'm going to let your arms rest, guys. <laughs> when you hold your arms up, that, that's a long time, wasn't it? <laughs> mm -mm, don't confess that. Say I'm getting younger in Jesus' name. I'm getting younger. That's right. Your arms need to hear you say it. That's why. I just preached a message to Jeremy. Did y'all get that? That was bonus content. Didn't cost you nothing. Don't get rid of my roof now. I may need it in a minute. Okay, you guys got this? Since I have a limited ecclesia, and since I have limited kingdom, and since I have limited grace, and since I have limited purpose, guess what else I have? Limited expectations about what God's going to do in the end time. I think, in fact, since I, I have a limited view of grace, which means I don't believe I am enough. Since I have a limited view of grace, which means I don't believe God can do it through me. I believe God can work miracles, just not through me. Because the opposite of grace is I am not enough. I am not enough. So then guess what? I don't believe the Lord can actually bring transformation to the nations until Jesus comes back. Because he's the one that's good at this. He's the one who's going to come back, defeat all of the enemies, and then he's going to establish his kingdom, and we're going to rule and reign with him forever. 
Well, it is true that we're going to rule and reign with him forever, and he is coming back, but he's coming back to present the kingdom to the Father as a finished fact. He's coming back to present the finished temple so that God may be all in all. The question is, do we actually, can we receive the capacity to believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is enough in you and me right now to actually bring real transformation to Mansfield, Texas? Or to Burleson? Or to Arlington? Or to Midlothian? Or to Waxahachie, as the man said. Waxahachie. Do we have the faith to believe this is what this message is all about? And next week, I'm going to come back and talk to you about counting the stars. And I'm going to talk to you about how God is taking our children from being the dust of the earth, formless and shapeless and easily blown about by every wind of doctrine, and how he's transforming our children and bringing them into positions of influence in the world like the stars of the heavens. But before we can believe God for that We have to have unlimited eschatology. We have to have an eschatology that believes, or as Harold Eberly put it, victorious eschatology. And by the way, let me recommend his book to you. If you're interested in studying about the kingdom, maybe you have a lot of questions about, I thought the Bible says that in the last days things are going to get worse and worse and worse. They did. Because the last days the New Testament is talking about is the last days of the Old Covenant. So when Paul said, we are the generation upon whom the ends of the world has come, he meant the end of the old world, the end of the old covenant world. When Joel said, in the last days saith God, I'll pour out my spirit. And when Peter quoted it and said, this is that, he was saying it because Peter was standing in the last days of the old covenant. And when the temple was destroyed, then that which waxeth old and decayeth is ready to vanish away, Hebrews says. And when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, the last remnants of the old world was removed. And we entered into a new age, the age of the kingdom that has been growing in the world ever since Jesus went into heaven and poured out the Holy Spirit. And now the kingdom is growing in the world until we come to a place of victory where the temple of God, Jews and Gentiles together in one body, becoming the habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 2, until the ecclesia becomes the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Until we become that one new man he's created us to be and the church grows up into its maturity. Until the fullness of the Gentiles precipitates the jealousy of Israel and their hearts turn back to Christ as their Messiah. And you see a massive number of Jews and Gentiles coming together in one body to be the unified, unbroken, undivided body of Christ. And that is the victory of the kingdom that the New Testament predicts. Now, you need to go back and listen to last week if you're wondering about all of those scriptures I just ran through like a marathon sprinter. Now, you know what I see? I see a revelation of the kingdom coming to people to where we no longer live in the paralysis of end times fear. We have a generation right now that every time war breaks out in the Middle East or every time something goes bad with the economy, or every time COVID or a pandemic or anything happens like that. Listen, I've lived through the end of the world at least a dozen times myself. I can't tell you how many antichrists I have seen come and go. Now, I'm not just trying to be a mocker here. I'm just trying to tell you at some point, wouldn't you think we would start wondering if we got our our theology right? Don't you think at some point we would start backing up and saying, hang on a second. We, I, mean, I remember, I don't remember 1973, but I was born in 70, so right after. I was born into the era of the Yom Kippur War. I was born into the era of late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey. 1981, it's got to happen because 1948, 40 years is 88, seven years back, has to be 1981. Jesus is coming in 81. I remember them saying we, when he didn't come in 81, I remember them saying we found the social security checks that have 1984 on them. That means Jesus is going to have to come back before 1984, 1984, 666 rather. They have 666 on the checks, 1984. We know Jesus has to come back in 1984. And then it was 88 reasons in 88. And then it was 89 reasons in 89. That was an updated and revised edition. Am I telling the truth? Anybody in this room besides me remember that? It was Charles Dyer in 1990 saying that Saddam Hussein was the new Antichrist. When that didn't happen 10 years later after 9-11, he came back and republished the same book. He said, well, he wasn't the Antichrist 10 years ago, but now he is. 
And then it was 1993, Yasser Arafat, Yitzhak Rabin, signing the covenant with Bill Clinton. And everybody says, 93, it's just too, but the math just works. It's 93, Jesus is coming back before 2000. So if you believed in pre-trib, you were thinking he was coming in 93. If you were post-trib, then you were thinking he's coming in 2000. If you were mid-trib, you was trying to hit somewhere in 1996. And then what happened in 2000? Anybody remember? Y2K. We are still eating tuna. <laughs> and drinking bottles of water from Y2K. <laughs> Not literally, but my spirit is bruised. We all lived through Y2K and then 9-11. Oh my God, 9-11. And then, even, oh, 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 forgive me, forgive me. I bypassed Ronaldus Magnus, as he was once called. Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. How did we know? Because his, each of his names has six letters. Ronald Wilson Reagan. Six, six, six. There it is, Antichrist. And then Obama. Obama's got to be the Antichrist. Bill Clinton was the Antichrist before him. And the other people on the other side of the aisle, it was George Bush. W is the devil. How many Antichrists have we seen? And Yasser Arafat went ahead and died. I guess his stint as Antichrist expired. Now, why? I'm not just trying to be a mocker. I'm trying to tell you, listen to me, Ecclesia of King Jesus. We've been living within a tent of limited expectations because we have developed an eschatology that believes that the kingdom cannot come until the king comes back. And that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I must go away. It's expedient that I go away because the kingdom of God can only come in the world as Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father for he must reign until his enemies are put under his feet and you and I are a part of the subduing of his enemies. Okay. All right. Stand with me, and I want to quote you a couple of scriptures in conclusion. It's 10 after 12. We're about to do baby dedication. But I've got to rock. Thank you, guys. I've got to rock somebody's faith here today. Paul said, I'm praying for you, for the church in Ephesus, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, which is the nations of the earth, by the way. That you might know the hope of his calling, that you might know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of his power. Why does Paul want you to have a revelation of the power of Christ that works within you? Because the the false idea of limited grace makes you think you're not enough. You don't have what it takes, only Jesus. As Bill Johnson says, many people have more confidence in the second coming than they do the day of Pentecost. The power of the Holy Spirit has come within us to do this job. So, hope of his calling, riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. When he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Above all principalities and powers and might and dominion. And put everything under his feet. Even every name that is named. Look at this, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Do you see that? Paul is not postponing the victory of Christ until the age to come. He says, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It is his body that brings the fullness of glory until the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. God's doing it through his church. And then he prayed again in Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom every family in heaven and earth receives their name. From whom every family in heaven and earth receives their name. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, 
and the height. What's Paul saying? I want you to get out of your box and get into God's box. That you may have the strength with all the saints to comprehend what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. And to be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all we are able to ask or think according to the power of the second coming. I believe in the second coming. I believe Jesus is coming, and I believe it's going to be powerful. It's going to be awesome, and I can't wait until he comes again, and all things are wrapped up. We come to the consummation, the resurrection of the dead. The curse is broken forever. God is all in all, new heaven, new earth. I can't wait for all that God is going to do. I believe in it. All I believe is that we cannot wait till then and twiddle our thumbs and stay in our little tent until God comes to do it for us. No, he says, you come outside because I got something I want to show you because I'm going to do it through you and I'm going to do it through your generations like these babies we're about to dedicate right now. I'm going to do it through your generations. So say it with me again and this time let's quote it right. Y'all quit messing me up. Now to him who is a say it with me now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we are able to ask or think according according to the power that is at work in us it is christ in you the hope of glory come on give the lord praise Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your people. I thank you that you have anointed me to labor in your word today, that not one word too much or one word too little has been spoken today. I thank you, Father, that in this house you are releasing unlimited faith, audacious faith. And that in this place and in our lives and our families and our hearts, we are breaking out of Abram's tent. We're coming out of the systems and structures of religious expectation. And we're coming out of institutional religion. And in the name of Jesus, we're stepping into the kingdom. And we will see your kingdom come. We will see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. 